the journaling of hardly profound and infinitely subtle is always encountered yet rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, perceive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma from hardly profound and infinitely subtle is always encountered yet rarely perceived. Now that we see, hear, perceive, and maintain this, may we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. The Dharma from hardly profound and infinitely subtle is always encountered yet rarely perceived. Now we see, hear, perceive, and maintain this. May we all realize the Tathagata's true meaning. Well, good. Uh, it's September 17th, 2016, and we're at Lane, somewhere not that far from Dublin. <laughs> I'm not even sure how far Dublin is, so come here from Belfast, so Belfast is, I don't know how far that is. So, good morning to all of you. Um, as I said earlier, I'm going to try to see if I can stimulate a little discussion here. Uh, and uh, if not, I'll just keep going on and on and on. <laughs> I used to threaten people that if they didn't start asking questions, I was just going to continue the entire uh, Dharma talk with Godzilla trivia. <laughs> I don't, I, I haven't threatened that for a while because people usually, uh, people usually come back fast and start asking questions uh, right away if I do that. But I, I can do Godzilla trivia for <coughs> at least an hour um, easily. So don't tempt me. It's odd hearing my name intoned as one of the Osho's <laughs> this morning. I mean, I appreciate the gesture, but... Um, I forgot your Dharma name. Uh, Oro Bene. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it makes me think of being dead. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know... I, I, I just started thinking about how uh, you've got that stoop out there made to the Rinpoche. I guess he's going to be interred in there when he's dead. I don't think I'd want to have my gravestone built and <laughs> in my uh, front yard um, <clears throat> for the last several years of my life. Uh, I don't think I'd, <laughs> I'd really appreciate that. But, um, but then again, I, I'm, not, I'm not that keen on being um, remembered. Occasionally people will say that to me, like, how are you going to be remembered? And I'm like, oh, I've got these, I've got these books out, and I guess it's, it's probably because once you've written books, it's, it's unavoidable that, that people you don't know will remember you after you die. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't control that, so it's fine. Um, The, uh, I, I'm, this, I, I guess I would start out, uh, there's a couple of things I can start out with. Uh, one is how much I hate uh, retreats and sessions. <laughs> uh, so if any of the rest of you dislike them, uh, you're not a friend in me. And this is my second uh, of these. Uh, I did two days in Belfast. Let's see if I can remember them all. Let's see, two days in Belfast, three days here. We have one and a half here. Um, let's see, next one is Hebden Bridge in England. That's four days. Then after that, I believe another four days uh, in the far outskirts of Helsinki, Finland. Then a day in Stockholm. I think two days retreat in Berlin. Um, let's see, two days in Munich. Uh, and then five days in this place called Benedictus Hof, which is near Frankfurt, uh, near Würzburg more, uh, but people don't usually, no, non-Germans don't seem to know where Würzburg is. 
I barely know where it is, and I've been there several times. And, uh, and then after I get back to Los Angeles, I get about 10 days off, and then another three-day retreat at Mount Baldy Zen Center up, um, up in the mountains outside of Los Angeles. So, uh, for a guy who hates retreats, I'm going to be doing a lot of them. And they're, they're an interesting experience uh, for a lot of reasons. I've done, I've done a lot of them over the past 30-odd years that I've been doing uh, Zen practice. But it took a while before I did my first one. Uh, when I, I first started studying this Zen stuff, when I... A university student in Ohio in the mid they call it the Midwest I, I, if you actually look on a map it's more like northeast of uh, the United States I think it got uh, actually trivia here I actually recently learned why it was called the Midwest because it was named the Midwest before the United States actually had any concrete plans to expand all the way to the Pacific uh, Ocean so uh, so it actually was the Midwest at the time So uh, I started studying Zen with this guy named uh, Tim McCarthy, that's an uh, Irish fellow of uh, Irish origins. I, I'd forgotten, I need to ask him, because he told me recently and then I totally forgot whether it was his parents or his grandparents who immigrated to the United States, but it was, it was one or the other, so he's a pretty close generationally. You know, a lot of Americans will say, I'm Irish, but they're like, you know, it's, it's ten generations back. Uh, Tim's actually much closer to that. So uh, I, I studied with him for about 10 years in Ohio without ever doing anything longer than, I might have done two-day retreats, I can't remember. I can clearly remember a couple of one-day retreats where we'd sit from, um, I don't know, 7 or 8 in the morning until 4 or 5 in the afternoon. We might have done a couple of those where we did those two days in a row. But nothing longer than that because uh, at the time there really there wasn't anything local that offered anything longer than that. Uh, the I, I would have had to go out to upstate New York, which would take about ten hours in the in the car to drive uh, to find the uh, John, John bless you John Dido Lori's place where they offered seven day retreats, and then I've heard I've heard rumors that maybe there was a place in Minneapolis, but that was a, even farther away. You could go, uh, Ted Geary Roshi was still alive, uh, but Minneapolis probably would have taken a day or, or more to, to drive to Minneapolis. So I didn't do any. And uh, when I moved to Japan in 1993, uh, first year in Japan didn't do anything like that. Second year I uh, moved, I, I was in a rural part of Japan for a year and then I moved to Tokyo. And in Tokyo, that's where I discovered uh, Budo Wakunishijima, and uh, he had uh, three-day retreats that he would do in the summers, and those were the first sort of full-on retreats. You'd go to a temple in, in Shizuoka, and it was um, out in the middle of the tea fields and the hills. It was very lovely, uh, and those were the first retreats, and I've since done, uh, like I said, a lot of them uh, since then. So, uh, and, and I hate them, all of them. Uh, they're terrible. But, uh, but you always feel better when you get finished with them. So in a way, they're a bit like vomiting. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so uh, you can enjoy it on that level, I think. Because uh, you just tell yourself that once this is over, you'll feel much better. In a way, it might be like sort of, I, I just thought of this as I'm saying, it might be like psychologically vomiting. Because seshin is setsu shin, which is... Uh, Setsu, in this case, there's a lot of words in Japanese that are pronounced setsu. Japanese is one of those languages with uh, a lot of words that sound the same and mean different things. And this setsu means cleaning, and shin is uh, kokoro, uh, or mind, uh, or heart, if you want. Uh, so, uh, so in a way, we're cleaning out our minds. So in a way, we're, we're using this session to vomit all the stuff out of our, out of our minds, hopefully. And, uh, and though it can be a an unpleasant process while it's going on, it might be pleasant too, uh, it, uh, it always feels better when you're done, so, uh, so that's, that's always good. So in the interest of uh, sort of 
setting a precedent of answering questions, I would like to answer the question, at least my answer for the question of why, what's the meal ritual all about? Uh, it's, it's, one, it's one of the questions I answer often because, as I said, I do a lot of these retreats and it comes up a lot. People are always asking what's, what's the deal with the meal uh, services and all that. And, um, and different cultures have different levels of resistance to it. Uh, Americans are especially resistant to the meal retreats. Um, I've noticed that, that um, and, and I don't know if this is a general tendency, but of the German places I've gone, they're, uh, among the Europeans, the least resistant. They mm -hmm. seem to be okay with the, with the meal uh, things in the German retreats I've led, whereas the Americans hate it to death uh, and don't want to do it. Um, I'm not sure what the Finns think about it, because they don't talk about anything. <laughs> so, so I have no idea. Um, but anyway... I'll tell you what it's about to me, and this is probably a bit of an American answer, although I lived in Japan 11 years and we did these basically same chants and such like in Japan. In fact, I can, let's see if I can remember the first one um, in, in Japanese. Busho, Kakuda, Jodo, Magada, Seppo, Haranan, Yumetsu, Kuchida, Myorai, Oryoki. So that's um, basically as as is written here, Buddha was born in Kapilavastu, enlightened in Magadha, taught in Varanasi, entered Nirvana in Kushinagara, and now we set out Buddha's bowls. Um, actually, they don't say now we set out Buddha's bowls. We put that in English. It just says Buddha's bowls. Nyorai Oryoki is just Buddha's bowls. Uh, and then uh, we used to do the whole chant in Japanese, but that's as far as I can, uh, as far as is lodged in my memory, is only that bit. The, the reason for the meal chants is because meals are one of these things we do that are terribly important and in a lot of ways, in a microcosm, represent a lot of the things we're dealing with in Buddha's practice. Buddhist practice. Uh, one of those is, in order to be alive, we have to do things that other forms of life probably don't really like us to do to them. Uh, I've been a vegetarian for 30-some <clears throat> years, uh, but I'm still, every time I take a meal, killing something. Uh, either it's a plant that had to be dug out of the ground when it was perfectly happy there, or all of the bugs that get up, dug up of the, out of the ground with them, and the mice and things that get caught up in those <laughs> machines, and, and uh, there was a big issue at uh, Green Gulch Farm, which is this uh, Zen farm run by the uh, San Francisco Zen Center up in Northern California over whether to use blood fertilizer. It turns out most uh, commercial fertilizer these days, the best stuff is, uh, is mixed with a lot of uh, animal blood in it because that makes the plants happy and they grow well in it. Uh, so there's that. So... Um, I don't know how the vegans are around here, but the vegans in Southern California are probably the most annoying species of human uh, around. Uh, I really uh, can I can I use uh, foul language in here because there's a good joke about vegans. Is it, do you think they'll accept it or they'll get upset? I don't think anyone will get upset. Okay, there's a there's a my favorite vegan joke is uh, how how can you tell if somebody's a vegan? They'll fucking tell you. Uh, <laughs> So um, that's that's the way it is, uh, and 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 um, especially in the neighborhood I live in, which is tends to be the hipster part of Los Angeles, uh, the um, the vegans there are very self righteous and and proud of them, themselves. But I, I think um, even if you're a vegan, you're you're doing a lot of um, unintentional harm, uh, just uh, just to keep yourself alive. And uh, meals are a place where this comes uh, together very nicely. And so these, these chants are a way of acknowledging it. And it goes all the way back to uh, the Buddha himself, who is said to have been moved to tears when he was a child and saw the, um, 
the reapers, you know, which are not mechanized at those times, uh, but just people doing that and uh, pulling machines and so forth and, and cutting um, all these insects in half as they, as they plowed the fields for, uh, for the meals that he got to enjoy. So, uh, so I would assume the meal chants were a very early part of uh, the Buddhist uh, ritual uh, practice. Oh, am I, have I done something wrong there? Okay, good. <laughs> good to know. Um, so, so we, we remind ourselves of, of, this, of this fact. Uh, and, and there are also little things embedded in the chants. What, what I like about the, the chants, uh, this is another sort of American thing that I've encountered a lot in Los Angeles, uh, people being very resistant to doing chanting. Uh, a lot of people come to Buddhism because they have been, been disgusted by religion, and they, but they still want some sort of something in their lives. So they come to Buddhism because they've heard it's, it's this completely free dogma thing, and then they're swimming along happily in their Buddhist life, and all of a sudden they've got to chant something. Don't want to chant. Oh my God. Um, and uh, but these chants uh, are are not arbitrary. I suppose most religions are trying to do something with their their chanting. But uh, but these these sort of remind us of, of some of the Buddhist philosophy. Uh, we realize the emptiness of self clinging and of the three wheels, giver, receiver, and gift. This is about uh, the the very deeply philosophical notion within Buddhism that we are not separate individuals. I think, I don't know about you, but I think I grew up with the, with the, with the sort of image of the world, of me being this sort of autonomous unit that could go this way and that way, or pretty much wherever I wanted, or uh, within reason, uh, but, but independent of the world and of the rest of the world is sort of uh, this more or less dead or insentient stage on which I could do things and which you know, people can do things and so forth. But, uh, but the idea within Buddhism is that we're all part of a, a continuity and you can, you can see that. I'm a big fan of science fiction and I, I recently finished this book called Aurora by uh, author named Kim Stanley Robinson. And Kim Stanley Robinson, there's various, there's various types of science fiction author, for those of you who don't know science fiction. And Kim Stanley Robinson is what they call hard science fiction, which means that he's one of these authors who pays a lot of attention to actual facts and scientific theory and tries, rather than in the, you know, if you see something like Star Wars, it's barely science fiction because they don't they don't get, they don't care <laughs> about about what's actually possible. They just want to make a, an adventure set in outer space. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson is the other end of the spectrum, who's who's very rigid with his science. And so, wrote this book, uh, which was about the first manned journey to try to colonize another planet uh, outside of the solar system, and. Uh, and much of what he is trying to say in that book, and I'll try not to be a, too much of a spoiler alert in case anybody wants to actually read it, but what, much of what he's trying to say in that book is, I don't know if he has any grounding in Buddhist philosophy at all, I've never read up on, on him to that level, but it seems to be grounded in this, in this idea that the Buddhists also have that human beings are not simply these in independent autonomous units who you can put in a spaceship and send off to another planet. We are actually part of, of this planet. And, uh, and it's a somewhat pessimistic outlook at, uh, look at the possibilities of colonizing another planet. And here's the spoiler alert, it turns out it's impossible um, because we are, we are part of this planet. And anywhere else you would try to transplant us, there's no way anyone can figure out all of the things we would need 
to support us. So people just, people, plants and things just start dying for no apparent reason because they, they thought they'd figured everything out uh, to keep everyone alive, but they, they actually haven't um, because there's just too many factors. Uh, because we are, we, are, we are actually extensions of this, of this planet, which I find very interesting. So this is, this is where we are, and so we're trying to find our way to be that but to be that in such a way that harmonizes with, uh, with the planet, which, um, which means we have to kind of tread a, a fine line between just, uh, th there's a sort of, if you go on the internet too much, which I have to do because it's you know, one of the ways I make a living, uh, you'll often encounter, they, they're, this especially comes out on people online, and there, there's, it's one of these things that people are sort of rarely voicing when they talk to you in person, but they get really into it online. It's a very, very pessimistic idea that human beings ought to just die uh, because we're such a blight on the planet and we all should just uh, go away. And there's that, uh, that view uh, is out there, and people can often make a, a what seems to be a reasonable case for that. But I, I actually don't think, I think that's going too far. I think we do a lot of damage, and we have to be careful about the amount of damage we do. But I'm actually more pro-human than that. I think, I think human beings, for all the bad things we do, and I'm not trying to, trying to minimize it, we are also um, just as vital to the to the biosphere as, as the elephants and the deer and the, and the wallabies and whatever else is out there. We are we're part of this of this continuum, and we we do uh, contribute to it, and we do uh, we do something for it, and we um, we may be we may be actually more important, I think, ultimately than than we're able to realize. I think maybe the planet sort of um, vomits things like us out of out of it uh, when it um, it feels uh, the need to do so when 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 perhaps there is a need for its its uh, continued survival to have something on it that can think its way around uh, various problems and and figure out how to uh, to solve them. I think there's actually a value to that, um, but we are in a stage where we haven't quite figured that out. Uh, we've only figured out the, the kind of selfish aspects of that, but we're starting to. I think we're beginning to understand how we, uh, how we can fit in and how we can become less of a blight and more of, of something that helps preserve um, the environment and so forth. Again, not that we've, we've succeeded yet, but I think, I think the direction is set. Um, let's see, I'll try not to go on forever. Oh my gosh, maybe I've already uh, used up all my time. No, no, no. Oh, okay, take your time. Um, this food comes from the efforts of all sentient beings, past and present, and is medicine for nourishment of our practice. Uh, we offer this meal of many virtues and taste to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and to all life in every realm of existence. May all sentient beings in the universe be sufficiently nourished. That's nice. It's very optimistic. As I was chanting this, I noticed there was a fly bashing itself against the wall, uh, the window next to me, and I thought, well, that fly is probably not going to be sufficiently nourished, because uh, that's what happens to flies. They, they trap themselves. There may be hope, because there's a lot of open windows around. So uh, maybe uh, he or she will make it out to the great world, but often they end up just uh, hitting themselves against windows until they finally starve to death and die. Um, so we, we are aware that, uh, that not everybody has it as, as good as we do. And we are aware that the food comes from efforts. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're just munching on a bag of... Uh, of, uh, of crisps, what's it, or, or whatever, I don't want to say the American brands, lest I be misunderstood. Uh, you kind of, you can easily forget that. You're just, you know, the television is on and you're shoveling it into your mouth. But even though, even that bag of, uh, of uh, what's it, or whatnot, um, they, um, they, uh, they come from somewhere. Someone has made effort uh, to, to create them. Uh, and we should be thankful for their for their efforts, 
in, in all in all cases. And um, and and one of the things that came up in that Kim Stanley Robinson book, one of the things they actually had planned for the the spacefarers, but they also found that their plans were still not adequate, even though they had really really worked it out, was that uh, soil. You know, soil, we look at soil and we think it's dead stuff. I, some of you may be involved in farming and know better. But uh, those of us uh, like me who grew up in urban environments just think of it as dirt. Um, but it's, but it's, actually, uh, it's actually something uh, much more complex than that. And uh, these, uh, these um, colonizers were landing on a planet that had an Earth-like atmosphere but uh, had not yet uh, developed any complex life form. So, uh, so the soil there, you couldn't plant anything in it and expect it to grow. It was just, it was actually just ground up rock um, and needed to be uh, infused with nutrients and, and dead things in order for it to, to live. So, um, so everything, everything comes from somewhere, uh, from past efforts, from, from efforts so far in the past that we, we can't even uh, know them. You know, there are it goes way, way back, uh, and it's medicine for the nourishment of our practice. That's the way uh, you're supposed to view your food, not as, um, not as just something to enjoy, but as a, as a kind of um, medicine to, to help you practice. Uh, so we, we do those five reflections, which are uh, different from the ones I've memorized, so you might have heard me stumbling. Uh, the, the worst part is when they're almost the same, but a little different, and then they, it just becomes a nightmare because you, you have to kind of uh, keep going back and forth in your brain to get it all straightened out. Uh, but um, regarding, this one is changes a lot of it. We regard greed as an, as an obstacle to freedom of mind. Actually, the one I, this is, a, this is one of those cases, ours is the obstacle to freedom of mind. It's just a small a small change in the article, but it, it makes me trip up. Um, some of them don't don't include that part, but uh, but greed is a is a significant aspect that often comes up while eating, and it's uh, it's something we have to guard against. I was doing a retreat, a part of, I was part of a retreat in uh, where were we in Minnesota, in southern Minnesota, called Great Sky. And Tonin O'Connor was one of the teachers, and she is, is, I think she may have retired now, but she was the head of the, the Milwaukee Zen Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And she made this statement uh, about how we can't have just a little bit of greed, which I found interesting. I don't know if she thought of that before or just spontaneously said it. But there's this kind of feeling that, well, we'll just allow ourselves a little bit of greed. And then we'll get over it. But uh, but greed is kind of on or off, I think. So so a little bit or a lot. And of course, a lot of greed does a, does more damage than a little bit of greed. But a little bit of greed still does damage, and it's impossible to uh, to not experience. It's one of these one of these things in 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 the practice is we we come to realize that um, much as we'd like ourselves to be better. Uh, things, certain things will always come up, which is one of the reasons we do this Shikantaza practice, this just sitting practice. If you start to go out in the wide world of bashing up against other forms of Buddhists, uh, there'll be people uh, you may encounter who will tell you, Shikantaza practice is impossible, you shouldn't even try it, it's only for blah, blah, you know, and go on. Whereas in the Soto lineage, uh, they throw you right into Shikantaza practice, which is this bare practice that we've been doing, which is uh, completely without any goal and completely without any objective. You're just sitting uh, for the sake of sitting and, and, uh, and not trying to do anything else, not trying to make yourself a better person or a more blissful person or, or whatever. We're just sitting, uh, which is... Um, which is regarded by many as, as so difficult as to be impossible and as to necessitate a lot of uh, years of preliminary practices that are supposed to get you ready uh, to do this. And um, one of the unique things about Soto-style Zen is, is we just get rid of all the preliminary practices and 
and uh, it's sort of like learning to swim by having somebody just throw you in the water and just go here swim you know um, it's one way to learn to swim <laughs> and, 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 and the metaphor is actually it extends uh, in, in a lot of ways if you look at it like that because if you if you swim that way the type of swimming you learn is is your own type of swimming you, know, you don't learn you may you may go back again later and kind of observe others and learn the breast stroke and the whatever stroke you know uh, the crawl and there are the butterfly. I don't know. It doesn't matter. All these other things, but um, but your initial foray into swimming is just figuring out how not to drown. And in a lot of ways, that's what Shikantaza practice is. Is you're you're just figuring out how to get through the next half hour uh, of this practice. It doesn't happen to me much anymore, but on occasions it'll still come up. But when I first started practicing, it happened absolutely every retreat. Uh, there would be a point in which uh, I, I was sure I had to, to run screaming out of the building. Uh, there, there, there was just no possible way. I never did in all those years. Uh, so, uh, so that's interesting. But, uh, but there was always a point, and, and there were points I got very close. There were points where I started off down the road from that temple in Shizuoka with the intention of trying to figure out how to get the bus back to Tokyo uh, before I, I turned back and decided, okay, no, I'm just going to get through it. Um, there were, there were uh, a number of people at the retreats uh, that I participated in and led that, that just disappeared. Uh, this is something, uh, just a little housekeeping, maybe, um, maybe it's been said already. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, if, you, if, you, if you really need to leave a retreat, uh, tell somebody you're going to leave the retreat. Uh, don't, don't just walk off, because that, that, uh, that causes a lot of serious problems, because you know, you're, you're, you're looking for the person, you're calling the police and making a missing persons report. We never got that far, but, um, but it's a you know, it's a possibility, uh, trying to figure out where this person has gone and trying to figure out how to fill all the jobs that they signed up for that they're no longer going to do. That's, um, you don't want to do that. So if you're going to re leave the retreat, tell somebody you're going to leave the retreat. Um, yeah, uh, so that's my talk, and I, I talk too much, and maybe there isn't any time for a discussion, but if anybody has anything they want to discuss, uh, we can do so. I, I don't know really how close we need to keep the schedule or... Or what we need to do. Yeah, feel prepared to go through as I, long as it's necessary. Just like a, uh, about the, if they throw you in the water, you find your own way to swim. Yeah. I mean, something in me just relaxed. So watching a kid drowning swimming, so <laughs> I didn't know whether he was swimming or drowning. He wanted to swim. Oh, right. Way. He didn't want to drown from somebody else. Did he do the mantra? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you said drowning, I was a little worried. <laughs> I was yeah. on the side wondering was he drowning or Sorry, was he swimming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would interfere with the process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I just think that's the, the, it's not the only way to do it, but I think there's a, a tremendous value in doing it that way because you really, you really learn, you know, it really becomes part of your being, you know, um, rather than having somebody, somebody teach you a technique. Mm. Uh, it's, it, it works sometimes. And in the case of meditation, there's a strong tendency for people to get so involved in the technique that um, that they just become very good at a technique. Uh, you know, you, you get good at repeating your mantra, and the mantra ends up being the thing that you retreat to when things are getting bad. And uh, I don't know how, how um, not to disparage other forms of meditation, but I don't know how much value there is to to constantly retreating to something like that, uh, it seems to me to be another way. If it, you, you can go drown out the noise in your head with entertainment or drown it out with a mantra, but it feels like about the same process to me. Um. I'm looking back and I hear what you were saying a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Are there much? Uh, well, 
Yeah, it, it depends on where you go. The, the teacher I had, Nishijimuro, she was not, some, not terribly strict. Uh, but his way of teaching was, in a lot of ways, the Japanese style. Whereas in, in, in Western countries, particularly in America again, but probably, it probably goes across the board, people like it, to have it explained to them. You know, I've done, I've done retreats where, uh, I remember doing a retreat about three years ago in Los Angeles where I thought I had uh, really just overwhelmed everybody with just explanation after explanation of what we were doing and why we were doing it and blah, blah, blah. And somebody in my, the group I have out there in Los Angeles got the brilliant idea of doing these comment cards and, you know, so people would write their comments, and I made the mistake of looking at them. And, and about three different comment cards complained about lack of context, by which they meant that, that things weren't explained well enough. And I thought, you're lucky you weren't doing this in Japan, because they wouldn't explain anything to you. I mean, they, nothing. You know, they, they, they don't even tell you how... You might get a handout before the retreat that you can read that tells you what you're going to do at the retreat. But if you don't pay attention to that handout or if you forget it, you, that, you're just on your own. You're not going to get an explanation about how to walk in the zendo or how to sit or what you're supposed to do. Everybody's just doing it, you know, and that's it. You're, you know, that you're on your own. So that's the Japanese style within Soto. Of course, there's a lot of other ways uh, to do things. Um, I, I tend to, if I'm, if I'm in a group like this where, you, where you've got something established, I, I'm, I'm just going to try to follow along with what's already established, the, the, the tradition that's already being done here, and I'll just try to figure out how to do it. Uh, a lot of other times I have to, I'm the only one in the room, or one of you know, two or three people in the room who have any idea how to do any of the ritualized stuff, so I end up having to explain uh, to everybody. Uh, which I noticed the Germans, <laughs> this is terrible to say, the Germans are good at that. You know, you explain, <laughs> you explain it to them once and they, they pretty much get it. Uh, the Finns, too, are, are real good at that, but other countries are, are terrible. Uh, the Americans are terrible, 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 terrible. <laughs> uh, because we have this, this uh, strong idea of the individual and everybody wants to customize everything, you know, and I'll tell them how to do the chant, you know. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I've said, okay, do you understand that? It's two notes in Shingo, right there. And then, you know, okay, yeah, I understand. Shingo. That's <laughs> what comes out. <laughs> Why are you doing that? Uh, anyway, so you get those little differences. Um, but, you know, of course there are, there are, uh, who knows how many forms of Buddhism are out there? Uh, because Buddhism, uh, I'm always, I always like to point out to people, has 500 years more history than Christianity. And, and you, you were all aware of how many forms of Christianity there are. So uh, add 500 more years of being able to split up and decide to do things differently. That's how many forms of Buddhism there are. I'm, I'm sure there are more <coughs> forms of Buddhism than Christianity, and some of them are so vastly different from from each other that uh, that it's hard to recognize you know where the the core elements are uh, it's it buddhism is actually the word buddhism there's a there's a book called the british discovery of buddhism which uh, which is a nice little thin book but it's about how the the british when they came into india and and started trying to colonize other parts of asia uh, there were there were these sort of sociological researchers who who uh, were examining the cultures there, and as far as anybody knows, they were the first ones to come up with this concept of Buddhism as 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 an all encompassing umbrella term for all of these other, uh, for all of these various uh, different things. I mean, there was a, there was an understanding, I suppose, that they all came from a common root, but I don't think uh, most Asian people before. The British started calling it Buddhism. Really thought of the what they did in Tibet and what they did in Japan and what they did in Sri Lanka as being, you know, the same you know, variations on the same uh, thing. Uh, you know, it wasn't really 
I suppose if somebody sat down and contemplated it, they might have been able to see it that way, but it wasn't really thought of in general terms that way. So there's a lot of differences in that. Probably, I, I think it. I think different kinds of of something like this have appeared in different cultures at different times. Uh, if you look <coughs> at some of the writings of the early Christian contemplatives, uh, uh, m their practice of centering prayer often seems um, in almost eerily close to zazen. They don't. They don't do the posture the, the same. That's sort of an Indian innovation, but they, the, the mental aspect of it, of, of letting go of everything, there's a few of the Christian mystics talk about this, um, uh, of, um, of completely letting go of any sort of attempt to control what goes on in your, in your mind and just being very, very quiet. That, that appears there. But the, the story of how Buddha came upon this form of meditation, which, you know, you'll find people who might dispute this, but it, the story I've heard goes that he, he had practiced, he was an Indian prince, some of you probably know the story, most of you probably know the basic story, who uh, got sort of disillusioned by the life of luxury and all that, and went and did a lot of ascetic practices and meditative practices and things that were available in India in those days. And he, he became quite advanced in several of these to where there was two different teachers who wanted him to be, to carry, you know, to be the, the carry on their tradition. Uh, and he refused uh, both of those, those teachers because he thought that their practice was still not what he was looking for, even though he'd become very adept at it. And the practice that he settled on, so the story goes, was after kind of rejecting everything, he remembered being a child and sitting on a rock overlooking his, his father's uh, fields and thought, and, and just remembered this kind of peace and, and calmness that had come out of that practice mm -hmm. and decided, well, that, I'm going to make that my practice. Just, just forget all the techniques and forget everything. I'm just going to just going to make this this bare sitting. So I think in, in that sense, it's I, I think I think there is though some value to the refinements that have been uh, practiced over the years within a particular tradition. I mean, I have to be careful of saying this uh, because people get uh, very wary of anything that sounds sectarian. I found this out when I was working on my first book, Hardcore Zen, that uh, the um, the editor kind of almost burst a blood vessel over, over something that I'd put in there that he thought was sectarian. And, oh, you know, and, um, he sent me this very angry email when we were going through the process of working on this because I was being sectarian. Um, you know, that, that idea that yours, your thing is the best. Uh, but having said that, if I didn't think Soto-style Zazen practice was, was better than, than anything else out there, I would be doing the thing that I thought was better than anything else out there. So it would be dishonest for me to, to, to say that I didn't think it was better. But it's not better because we want to go burn down everybody who does anything else or anything like that. It's, 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 it's just a, 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 very, um, it's a very refined version of this, of this practice that's been honed over years by a lot of people who were... Who were one of the things I like about Buddhism is that it's um, 
there's this this old phrase it's no dependence on uh, no dependence on words or letters something like that it's a chinese phrase mm-hmm. and people people just sort of uh, kind of you know when i first heard that i'm like oh good we don't have to worry about scripture but it, it's a, it's a much deeper meaning in that we don't hold uh, oh, what is ancient as sacred just because it's ancient. So just because Buddha did it this way doesn't mean we can't um, figure out a way to do it better. You know, this might, might sound like blasphemy for, for some people. But, uh, but there, is, there is the idea, and I believe that if you look at the oldest sutras and the, what, what little scraps we have preserved of Buddha's words, he does appear to me to be leaving the door open for people to... Um, refine what he had done, what he had put out for them. So he wasn't trying to say, this is the final revelation from God. He was saying, let's try it this way and see where we go, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And so the, the door is open for, for people in later generations to, to go, oh, yeah, maybe we can, we can um, fix this bit and, you know, do that and, and try to make it a little better. So I, I like the balance um, that we have here, uh, also knowing that in future there may be a, a way to give it more balance uh, than we have it now. But there's a balance between like a kind of reverence for the ancient ways and, and trying to do a few rituals and things, and a kind of uh, a kind of just saying, well, the you know the rituals are are only as good as they are. Uh, you don't have to hold on to them just because they're old. Um, so that was a long-winded answer to that. Brad, you talked about sort of our interconnectedness there earlier, you know, in relation to the science fiction story and our, our sort of place in the biosphere and so on. Um, and it just made me think of the, the idea of sort of engaged Buddhism or yeah. engaged Dharma. But, you know, what, how can we make ourselves a better part <coughs> of that kind of interdependent kind of structure? I think I think I think you make yourself a better part of it just in, in any way that that seems right to you. You know, I like the idea of engaged Buddhism. Engaged Buddhism, though, sometimes it's, I, I I'm always I'm one of those contrary people. So so don't take this as a put down of engaged Buddhism. But I, I I find a lot of the same things engaged Buddhism that frustrate me about the engaged Buddhist movement that frustrate me about punk rock when I was part of the whole punk rock scene, which was that punk rock, to me, what was attractive to me was this sort of absolute freedom and and just trying to do whatever you could, but then it became codified into a certain um, structure where punk rock meant having the black leather jacket and the tight jeans and the Doc Martin shoes, and and so it became a uniform rather than a, a, a way to be completely free of uniforms. And the same thing I think happens a little bit in engaged Buddhism. It's it's the the idea of engaged Buddhism of of trying to trying to do something to help um, the world and humanity is great. But I find that when I <coughs> kind of look in, you know, I peek into those usually on the internet, uh, not in person. Some of these more hardcore engaged Buddhist sort of things, it becomes we are doing this, this, and this, and these are engaged Buddhism. Whereas I had an interesting conversation with my with my teacher that might relate with Nishimo if you would might relate to this. At the most of the time that I was working with him as his student, I was also working for this company called Tsuburaya Productions in Japan, whose stock in trade was making these uh, uh, films and television programs. Uh, I'd have to say bad science fiction films and television programs. You know the kind where people put on a rubber dinosaur suit, and then there's a there's a, a little miniature Tokyo, and they come and and bash their way through it, and all of that. That's where I worked, uh, and I, I I enjoyed it. I, I really liked that company, and I liked the programs that we made. I thought they were fun, and I had a good time. Before that, I got that job, though, I was working in Akron, Ohio, at the Summit County Board of Mental Retardation and Developmental Disabilities. Apparently, uh, in recent years, they've shortened that name. Um, but I was always proud of myself for being able to memorize the whole thing. And what that company did uh, was 
I'm not sure how much you know how America is. I'm not sure much how, how much government funding there was, but there was a certain sort of um, I think it was you know, privatized mostly. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, but anyway, what our stated uh, goal was uh, was helping mentally handicapped adults to uh, work in normal quote in quotes normal workspaces. A very small percentage of the people that we we uh, were working with ever got that far, but uh, but that was always the goal. It was very noble, you know. It was this, you know, nobody could could argue with you if you you know when I told them where I worked uh, nobody could argue with how good of a person I was uh, because it was real hard work the pay was terrible and and, and you know I was wrestling you know, grown 45 year old men in and out of toilets and wiping their bottoms and you know it was all kinds of, of real gross stuff that I had to do uh, at that job um, for some of the more uh, seriously disabled clients, and then of course we had also clients who were who were practically able to just work on their own with just m m minor supervision. Unfortunately, I didn't get those rooms very often. <laughs> you know, I used to get sent to the really bad rooms. Anyway, so so I felt I felt terrible about this, and I and I had this uh, conversation with Nishijima about how I, I I just you know how I just didn't want to. I wanted to do something better with my life and, and, and all of this and I was just getting very angsty. And, 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 and he, was, he was a guy who rarely gave advice. You know, he, he, in all the years that I had so many conversations with him, he, he almost never would say, I think you should do. Uh, but that was, that was one of maybe three times I can remember him saying anything like that. And he said, I think you should continue working for Tsuburaya Productions. No. Um, and he explained to me that, that anywhere that you, that you put your efforts into, if you are guided by that idea of making uh, the world better, you can, you can make that sort of difference. So you don't have to be uh, necessarily uh, going in the, in the trenches and, and um, you know, feeding the, the homeless and, and saving the whales and all that stuff. I mean, not that those are bad things, you know, I don't want to be <coughs> misunderstood. And, and those, are, those are great things and those are necessary things, but you can also apply that same sort of engaged Buddhist mindset to anything that you do and find a way to, to make that a place where, where things uh, start to improve in the world, because there, there are all sorts of ways human beings are trying to, to, make, to make the world a better place. Uh, and, and, and if you get into a, a, a situation wherein you're working in a, in a workspace where most people don't have that mindset and you're the one who does, you can be a little bit of, uh, I, I think, a little bit of a, you know, a gyroscope. You know how they put that little tiny gyroscope at the bottom of a, of a battleship and it keeps the battleship from tipping over? Supposedly, I don't know my physics that well. Maybe somebody will tell me I'm wrong. But I like that image anyway. Uh, you know, you can, you can actually be the little gyroscope. Uh, it's one of the things I always say when, when I haven't written for Suicide Girls website in years, like seven years now. Uh, but uh, when I was writing for it, people were like, you're pornography, you're working for pornography. And I'd be going, well, yeah, uh, in a sense, I'm working for a website that, uh, that some people consider to be pornographic. But if I weren't working there, no, there would be zero Buddhist influence at the Suicide Girls website. And as long as I'm working there, there's something. You know, people are going online looking for their <coughs> boobies and butts and, and, and encounter this, uh, this little uh, article about, uh, about the Dharma and about, uh, about trying to live a balanced life. Uh, that, that's got to be interesting <laughs> for, for somebody who didn't expect it. Um, so, so, so I think anywhere you go, you can kind of, uh, you can kind of make, make that your place of engaged Buddhism. I, I'd like to think so. I've always wondered about the term, though, is because, you know, because it sort of suggests that Buddhism isn't engaged, mm. you know. That's the other thing I object you know, to it, <laughs> you know. It's like, sure, you know, in a way I can imagine if you, if you put the Dharma in practice with that, that it should just unfold from that. Mm. 
Yeah, that's always been my sense. But I mean, maybe we've had a need to create an English Buddhism in the West. I don't know, or or, or maybe it failed in, in Asia. You know. Maybe yeah. I, I think I think there is a there is a, a sense. You know, there's this this argument that you'll often hear that that what we're doing here is kind of this selfish practice because we're kind of working on ourselves. But I, I think working on ourselves is how we how we uh, help the world. Because um, one of my favorite things uh, of all times is this guy, um, Rob Robbins, an unusual name, but he, he comes to my Zen group and he's, a, he's an interesting character. I could tell you a lot of stories about Rob. Uh, he's one of those sort of angsty, interesting characters. But he came up with this one thing one time when we were having a discussion, one of these kind of discussions, about the Bodhisattva vows. And the, the first Bodhisattva vow is, is the vow to save all beings. And he said, I, I take that as the vow to save all beings from myself. <laughs> you know? And, and, and I just love that, because that's, that's, I think, is, is, uh, is the best way to understand the vow to save all beings. You know, you're... you're you're not out there trying to, to be Superman and and uh, and and you know rescue Lois Lane wherever she happens to to be. Why is she always getting into, into trouble anyway? Um, but uh, but rather you're you're trying to work on yourself so that so that when you move through the world, uh, you are no longer uh, this walking disaster mm -hmm. that you might have been before you did this practice. And it's very interesting what you say. I was kind of misquoting you, but I think there's a lot in it. If you want to save the world, you start by cleaning your bedroom. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I think for me, when I heard that, I think there, there is a lot in that, you know, because it's your attitude, it's everything, isn't it? Just cleaning your room, you know, you might yeah. do it for yourself, but actually the reasons you're doing it and what you're doing and, and, and you know, everything about that, for me, kind of spoke. Yeah, it makes a difference. Yeah, the, thing, the things you do to kind of fix fix your own, what is it, Shunyu Suzuki was a shine, shine one corner. Uh, I, I love those sort of mutant English phrases you get from people whose first language isn't, isn't English. But uh, there's this quote by him, to shine one corner. Uh, and, and the idea is just kind of you keeping your little area neat and, and, and in doing so, uh, doing something for the world. Because you can't, you can't fix everything. You can do some work on yourself. Is, is it true when we're working on ourselves that guilt is not helpful, which is strange for a Westerner, I think. Yeah, I don't. I don't think guilt. I think. I think you know, guilt might have a little, a little spark of purpose, you know, and it might, it might help you, especially if you're kind of a thick-headed person. Anyway, it might, it might uh, spur you on to do something. But a little of it goes a long way, as they say. I, 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 and I think. Uh, I think most most of what happens after that initial spark of trying to do something because you feel bad about something else you did, then you know there's no there's no reason to keep rehashing it. You know you, you have that tendency to kind of um, you know rehearse it uh, for yourself. The old uh, Catholic guilt, right? Mm -hmm. Catholic guilt and Jewish guilt. Those are the two the two faiths that are really built. <laughs> <laughs> built up on guilt. Now, luckily, I wasn't raised in either one, so I don't know too much about that. But yeah, I, I think most of it's just... Um, it's, it's a way of reinforcing... It becomes a way of reinforcing the self. You know, it starts off as a way of going, oh, I did a bad thing, I should, I should make that right. But then it becomes a way of going, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Oh, me, me, oh, I'm bad. You know, and then it becomes a way of building up this self-image because a negative self-image is just as good as a positive one. You know, people think of building up the ego as being like, oh, I'm the greatest guy in the world, but I'm the worst person in the world is also a way of building up the ego. You can, uh, you can build it up just as, as uh, you know, grandiose, grandiosely, is that a word? I don't know. You can make it grandioser that way. Maybe we should... Uh, yeah, maybe that's gone on too long because yeah. we're, we're running out of time and I'm supposed to be focus on some people. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I mean we have a we have an equal amount of time tomorrow, so okay. uh, there you know, I, I know some of you have questions or maybe the questions will emerge between now and tomorrow. Maybe I'll try not to say in such a long winded beginning tomorrow. No, it was great. Thank you so much. Should we do you want to chant the Oh, the I'm page supposed to do it alone. Okay. Yeah.
Yeah. Do you, you want, do you want us to join in? Whatever you want. Page uh, 10. It doesn't matter to me. I usually... Uh, we, jo- we join in for the last bit. For the <coughs> uh, all Buddhists throughout space and time? Yeah, we join in for the last bit. Okay. <coughs> Let's go. May the merits of this teaching penetrate into each thing in all places so that we and every sentient being together may realize the Buddha's way. Oh, Buddha, throughout space and time, 